Welcome to the Faculty of Economics. We are delighted to have here Mr. Enria. I leave the word to the Rector of Sapienza University, who will give a brief introduction. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Brogi, dear Chair Enria, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and most of all, dear students. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to the Faculty of Economical Sapienza University of Rome for Mr. Arias' second Yacht Dialogue. The European Central Bank Yacht Di Dialogues allow young Europeans to engage directly with ACB policymakers by asking them questions and share their views with them. This evening, the students from Sapienza's Faculty of Economics will have the opportunity to do just this. So I wish to thank very much Mr. Enria in the chair of the Supervisory Board, European Central Bank, that as you all know, directly supervises 117 significant banking institutions in 19 countries. 12 of which are in Italy. Andrea Enria took over from Daniel Nui, who came to Sapienza three years ago. At the beginning of 2019, after a long and exemplary career as a civil servant at various supervisory authorities in Italy and Europe. He previously chaired the European Banking Authority from its formation in uh, 2011 to 2018. And before that, he also served as head of the supervisory regulation and policies department of the Bank of Italy. So, dear Mr. Enria, thank you so much for your presence here today. Sapienza is uh, very pleased to have you here. And we are de delighted to have uh, it and uh, are very thrilled to host this evening's Yacht Dialogue. So, thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you again, Ms. Area, for your presence here. Thank you, and enjoy this very intriguing opportunity. So now, a few words from uh, Fabrizio Lascenzo, Dean of the Faculty. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. It is a very important occasion for all of us and especially for our students to have Mr. Enria here with us. Uh, it is uh, one of the chances we are given to listen to the voice of uh, one of the main uh, professionals in uh, these uh, activities. And I want to thank uh, Professor Brogi for having organized this, uh, this important occasion. And uh, I hope that uh, this will be uh, a good occasion and uh, a chance for our students to deepen their knowledge in these topics. And uh, I, I hope that our students will use this occasion in order to open their minds and uh, to have uh, much more knowledge on these topics for their future. Thank you very much. So th thank you, Mr. Gaudio, Mr. Dascenzo, and welcome, Mr. Enria. Welcome also to all of you present today and everyone following the live stream. <laughs> we are actually live streaming the website. Yes, okay. Uh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay, I'll try again. So thank you very much. Also to the people connected via live stream. I will start by asking a few questions to Mr. Enria and then opening the floor so that you can ask him anything you want. 
For this, you can either raise your hand. Some of you I know have prepared questions, so you can, we will be given a mic and you can ask directly. And also people can send their questions online. You just need to follow very simple steps. We are organized with Slido, so what you must do is access slido.com. Then you log in with the code hashtag ECB Youth Dialogue to join the event. Then you can type your questions and press send. You can also have a look at the questions from other people and vote for the ones that you like the most. So the most voted questions are the ones which Mr. Enria will be answering first. Okay. We're going to have some questions directly from the floor here in Rome and then some questions which can be actually sent online and voted. So, of course, the questions with the highest numbers of votes will be prioritized in the discussion. All the online questions will be moderated, which means it might take some time before you see them on the screen behind me. Please consider the following instructions, however. Make sure your question has not already been asked. Send questions and not comments or statements, because the idea is to make the most of this evening by asking Mr. Enria real questions. So make the most of this opportunity. And needless to say, please avoid using inappropriate wording. Also, you are more than welcome to post <laughs> about this event on your social media. You can use the hashtag, hashtag ECB the Youth Dialogue, and also feel free to tag the ECB and the university on your social media posts. So that, I hope, is all clear. Go to Slido, access Slido, and you can actually start typing in the questions. Now I'm going to start with my questions <laughs> to Mr. Enria. And as some of you know, I am a professor of here at the Faculty of Economics. I teach international banking and capital markets. But one of my core competencies in the last few years has been corporate governance. And actually, bank corporate governance is one of the most regulated aspects in corporate governance. So my question is to Mr. Enria, how can governments, the role of the board, and also shareholders actually contribute to making a sounder financial system? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Gaudio, Professor Dascienza, and Marina for inviting me here today. I mean, I really enjoy it. That's the second time I do this youth dialogue, and uh, it's really something I, I appreciate very much. So I look forward to your questions and to a very interactive uh, evening here. Uh, governance. Governance is, is, is you're right, uh, Marina, is a very important, uh, a very important issue um, for a number of reasons. I mean, in general, uh, you, you don't find ever a bank that has gone, uh, let's say, bad, that has experienced a crisis, a crisis which didn't have a serious problem in terms of governance. Uh, it, is good, it is easy to say what is going wrong when the governance is not working uh, as it should. It's less easy to identify what are the ingredients for a good governance. Uh, but I would say that uh, in general we, we do have uh, a, a number of criteria which have been developed uh, in, in the regulations, in our practices. And basically we start from very, very basic things. First you need people who, who know the job. So you need experience, you need uh, uh, people who can devote time to the, to the, to the job they, 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 they commit to, 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 to do. But this is also not enough. I mean, they, they also need, you also need uh, a, a people who really are willing to challenge the management. I think that's the key point uh, to me. Uh, you need to have a real dialogue. You need checks and balances in the banks to make, uh, to make them healthy organizations. So you need also diversity. It's not only the quality of the individual members, it's also the quality of the board as a whole. So the, the, the diversity in, in a number of areas, diversity in terms of, uh, of experience, of background. For instance, you need increasingly people who, who know about uh, technologies in boards of banks. We have done an, an interesting analysis recently that shows that uh, banks that experienced uh, serious uh, cyber attacks or major lapses in, uh, in their own internal systems were also banks that didn't have, uh, uh, let's say, members in the board that knew about new technologies. You also need diversity in terms of gender, for instance. Uh, you need diversity in terms of, uh, in terms of background, so that's an important, uh, an important element uh, as well. 
well, of course, for us, uh, as supervisors, it's difficult no, to, to push on governance. Uh, if I look at what the ECB has done so far, we have been very effective on push in pushing on capital, in pushing on liquidity, in pushing on asset quality and non-performing loans. If you look at the scores that we give to the governance in our supervisory review and evaluation process, since we started, that's the only area where the scores have deteriorated, actually, instead of improving. Because that's an area where you don't have really very strong tools. You, you can try to convince, you can try to push, you, you write letters to the boards, but eventually, let's say, it's very difficult for us to say no to certain appointments. So the balance is mainly in the, in the hands of the shareholders, as you correctly say. They play a, a great role here, and as they are, are the ones that put their money at risk there, they should pay more attention to the governance, and they should be really more proactive in this area. Thank you. You mentioned the, 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 the ZREP cycle for this year. Um, I know it's just finished. Can you let us know how it went? Are you satisfied? How did it go? Well, we will have a presentation of our results for the, for the ZREP cycle uh, in, uh, in January, uh, so no real sneak preview here today. But uh, let's see what I can say, apart from the fact that several banks have already started announcing the, the results. What I would say is that uh, uh, consistent with what I already mentioned, let's say uh, we see improvements no, in, the, in, the, in the capital position of the banks. I would say that now we are basically, th th this rep is composed of four buckets. No? You have uh, uh, capital, liquidity, uh, governance and business model. Capital and liquidity, I would say, are the two areas where, where we are the most satisfied. So there has been significant progress. The banks are in a good place. We ran a, a liquidity stress test uh, in uh, and published the results in the, in the autumn this year, uh, which show that the banks are in a good place also in terms of their liquidity, uh, liquidity position, although we identify some issues that need to be followed up. Uh, the areas which are really uh, raising concerns on our side are, as I said, governance, and I won't come back on that, and business model. Business model sustainability. I mean, there are a number of banks which are really challenged in terms of their profitability. They are not generating profits for their shareholders. They have very high uh, cost to income ratios. Uh, they have uh, very poor market valuations, price to book values well below unity. And uh, uh, so this means that basically uh, the markets don't perceive these banks as, uh, as uh, viable in the medium term. They are, they are destroying value basically. And uh, in my view, that's, uh, that's something, of course, uh, uh, as a supervisor, it's not our responsibility to pump up the profits of the banks. Uh, but if banks do not generate enough uh, uh, income, no, in, uh, enough capital organically, and if they have very, very poor valuations that cannot go to the market to raise capital when this is needed, of course, they could be more fragile, less able to withstand crisis. So we are also concerned about this issue of low profitability, viability of business models. And we see that the banks, we have done an interesting study uh, a few years ago, which showed that the banks which are more profitable and which have uh, uh, been be better placed in terms of uh, 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 business model are those which have refocused their business model. So they have uh, uh, avoided to do, do the whole, the full monte of banking activities, but they have focused on the things that they do best. So they have good, they've had a good uh, strategic steer. The banks which have uh, been most effective in uh, reducing costs, in achieving cost efficiency, and the banks which have invested more in new technologies. I mean, these three elements are the, the, the elements which have really driven the, the change in business models, but we, we are still not in a good place for the system as a whole. What is your assessment of internal models? Uh, and the discretionality, which is intrinsic to Pillar 2, which <coughs> you mentioned rep. I know it's related, but internal models are one of the differences between large banks and small banks, and so it's a key point. Well, in internal models are one of the casualties of the crisis, right? I mean, uh, but uh, let's say I'm old enough to remember also the period when internal models were introduced. Um, it was, I remember, ju just after I, I started, I must confess uh, uh, how old I am, uh, I started as a supervisor when uh, exactly in the days when Basel I was being approved, so 1988. 
and uh, and I remember that there was in the in the in, in the years after Basel one there were plenty of studies that were started piling up, especially in the in the in the U.S. by the Fed, that showed how the um, the banks were able at the time to basically circumvent the broad brush uh, requirements uh, set up in Basel uh, through you know financial innovation basically, and they were started with securitization, with off balance sheet uh, activities and the like. So there was a, a, a very strong frustration in the supervisory community that uh, whenever you try to put you know standards, relatively rigid, uh, uh, one size fits all standards the banks uh, manage very easily to circumvent. And, it, and it we realize that it's very difficult for a supervisors to really catch up with the speed with which and the, the, the inventiveness, basically, of, 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 the, of the financial industry. So the, the, the idea, which I, I thought at the time, and I still think to some extent, uh, was, uh, was to try to align, to align the internal risk management of the banks and the external controls by the supervisor. So we said if we rely more on the internal models used by the banks to measure and manage their risk, they will not have an incentive to circumvent. And we will have a possibility through regulation to uh, intervene in their models, to check that they are good enough, to backtest them, to make sure that they are robust, and we will have the best of the worlds, in which basically the internal and external, the, 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 the market base and the regulatory perspectives are, uh, are aligned. Uh, the problem is that, of course, when you use a tool for regulatory purposes, you corrupt its, uh, its own uh, objectives, in a sense. So they, they, the, the incentives for the banks uh, to you know, tweak their models in order to minimize you know, the capital requirements becomes beca became very very high, and the ability of supervisors to catch up was uh, was not uh, was not uh, sufficiently sufficiently strong, and uh, and uh, uh, so the 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 choice that uh, that we had when the crisis came and the weaknesses in the internal models became apparent was binary i think i mean there was there were there was a strong camp with uh, very prominent academics uh, anat admati martin helvig uh, but also in the in the official sector for instance uh, um, at the bank of england there were voices uh, in, in arguing in favor of uh, really dropping any any use of models for for regulatory purposes. The other uh, camp, uh, which uh, which eventually prevailed in the Basel discussion, was to try to repair the use of internal models, so to reduce significantly the scope of internal models, and to try to constrain them uh, more from the regulatory perspective, but still to maintain the risk sensitivity uh, that internal models uh, had. And that's where we landed with uh, with the Basel uh, with the Basel for uh, well actually I shouldn't say that because in the 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 the, 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 the in, in the parlance of uh, of supervisors and central bankers there is no Basel four there is only Basel the finalization of Basel three but anyway the last package which is now in the pipeline tries to deal with the issues that we identified in internal models a lot of work has been done. Uh, by the European Banking Authority and by the European Central Bank. Maybe this is an anecdote. Uh, when uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned Daniel Nui, my predecessor, before, and uh, I worked with Daniel also when I was at the uh, SEBS, at the Committee of European Banking Supervisors in London. And when we were working together, we thought that uh, we should uh, launch uh, joint inspections between of inspectors from different countries to uh, monitor and test the, the, the models of the banks. And at the time, it was a very tough challenge to, to get the approval of the national authorities, but we were almost there. Then the crisis started in 2008, and the whole project uh, uh, sank. And uh, only when the ECB was established, Daniel managed to start the TRIM project, so the targeted review of internal models, and which I'm completing right now with uh, uh, we finished the 200th inspection in uh, uh, last month, so it has been a huge effort from our side, but I think it has been very positive, very positive for supervisors and for repairing the models of the banks. And, and actually, to your point, uh, internal models have problems, but it's actually true that 
not having internal models doesn't necessarily mean that the bank will be safe. And I know everybody in Italy is waiting for a comment on your part on Banca Popolare di Bari. So we're not going to sort of pretend it doesn't exist. Um, so just a thought on that, which of course in Italy is considered a crucial step. Well, uh, as you can imagine, I cannot comment on an individual case. Uh, by the way, uh, Popolare di Bali is, is what we call, with what I think is not a very good term, to be honest, a less significant institution. So we are not directly supervising uh, the bank, but of course we are uh, kept, uh, kept informed by, by, the, by the Bank of Italy on the, on the case. I would say that in general, I, in, in my experience since I joined the, the, the ECB supervision, um, I think that the, the, the key point is, uh, is uh, uh, that we are not yet there in terms of the effectiveness and the functioning of the mechanism for dealing with crisis. I think that after the crisis there was a lot of work done at the international level to identify what are the, the key uh, uh, ingredients for having an efficient uh, management of crisis and prevention of crisis as well, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that uh, the consensus has been around uh, three basic uh, uh, elements. The first one is that you need to have uh, strong capital and to have some loss absorbing capacity. So other instruments that can absorb losses at banks so that you can have some ability of private investors to absorb the losses uh, in, in a crisis. Uh, the second ingredient is early intervention. You need to be able to intervene early enough in a crisis. And, and the third one, which I think is also, uh, you know, uh, requiring uh, some further thoughts, is that uh, you need to have uh, e effective mechanisms for a smooth exit from the market of banks that do not, uh, do not uh, work, uh, work well. In this area, I think that we need to make an effort at the European level to develop, uh, uh, let's say, common uh, liquidation procedures. I think the idea was uh, we will have European mechanisms for the large cross-border groups, and they will go into resolution, will be managed by European authority in Brussels, the single resolution board. The rest could go under national liquidation uh, rules. But uh, the reality is that we have very diverse national liquidation rules. In some cases, the exit for the market is smooth. In some cases, it isn't. In some cases, we declare banks failure likely to fail, and then there is uh, no resolution triggered and also no insolvency under national legislation, so we don't know what happens. They remain in a limbo with an authorization to conduct banking activity. So I think that we need to put uh, the house in order a bit in this area, and in my view, we should uh, uh, harmonize much more the, the procedures for liquidation. And we have a good example. The FDIC in the US, in my view, is working uh, very well. Uh, they basically have a structure by means of which there is a federal authority entering the banks, usually during the weekend, and uh, um, uh, taking control, basically. Uh, then they restructure the bank and they do what is called purchase and assumption. So basically they sell assets and liabilities of the banks to other banks and they limit the, the impact on, uh, on, on the creditors, on other stakeholders. And in general, depositors, borrowers, don't even notice that a, a crisis is ongoing because they receive eventually a, a letter from, uh, from the authority saying that from tomorrow the, your bank will be named uh, with another name and nothing changes in their relationships. You, don't, uh, you have a, a backstop from the treasury which provides, let's say, safety to the depositors so depositors don't fly away. And you have uh, also that uh, shareholders and creditors eventually take the losses if there are losses remaining after the restructuring. And they managed to, 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 to have the exit of more than 500 banks from the market uh, after the crisis, uh, which eliminated a lot of excess capacity that was generated in the run up to the crisis. So I think we should try to work in that direction. You mentioned crisis and how to face crisis. What, what, what are your views on the proposal to reform the U European stability mechanism, which is another hot topic right now? 
the European stability mechanism, of course, is a hot topic for a number of reasons that fall well beyond my, uh, my uh, scope of responsibilities. Uh, for me, of course, the, the, the most important uh, entry point in this debate is that uh, the European stability mechanism, according to the most recent proposals, should provide the backstop uh, to the single resolution fund. So to the fund that should provide support uh, for the resolution of, uh, uh, of uh, European banks. And that's extremely important because uh, if, you, if you don't have this, uh, this, uh, this backstop, you wouldn't have uh, credibility of, uh, uh, of the uh, European uh, resolution, uh, resolution uh, mechanism. So I think that's, uh, that's extremely important. In my view, in general, it is essential that we move uh, towards a more European safety nets for banks. The other big ingredient is the deposit guarantee scheme, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, uh, EDIS, uh, which is not yet uh, uh, finalized. I mean, we have a single currency, the euro, and, uh, and I think that it is now should now be clear after the crisis to everybody that you cannot have a single currency if you don't have bank deposits that are benefiting from the same type of guarantees wherever they are held in the, in the, in the banking union. And uh, uh, th that's, a, that's a most important uh, element. And the other point is that if you don't have a common safety net, so a common single, a well-functioning single resolution fund, a common well-functioning deposit guarantee scheme, you wouldn't have uh, authorities allowing the banks to smoothly manage their capital and liquidity in the area as a whole, which means that you wouldn't have a truly integrated domestic market in the banking union. You would still maintain segmented pools of capital and liquidity in each, uh, in each member state. So if we have made this huge investment in creating the banking union, I think we should push it to the end and try to complete the safety net for the banks. The reform of the European stability mechanism is an important uh, step in that, uh, in that direction. Thank you very much. Last but one question from me. Um, looking, on the, looking at what, what awaits us, do you think that, that banks can help in, in sustainability in, the, in, the, in the, pr the action plan of the new commission and in promoting ESG? And what are your views regarding climate? The, there's the debate regarding the brown penalizing factor, the green supporting factor. Is it going to be pillar one, pillar two? Because clearly this is key and it's an area where Europe is further ahead than other, than other areas and perhaps we shouldn't lo lose the fact that we are further ahead. Well, sustainability is one of the most important uh, priorities of the European Union. Uh, it is uh, one of the top uh, items on the agenda of the, of the new commission just that just entered into, into, uh, into its uh, responsibilities. Um, and of course, uh, everybody, including ourselves as supervisors, the central bank has to contribute to the uh, objective of the, uh, of the union. Now, from the supervisory perspective, I would say that uh, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, areas in which we I think we could provide an input in this process. First of all, um, if, these, uh, uh, if we have to move towards a, a major transi transition that is envisaged in the objectives of uh, COP22. So uh, between now and 2050, we will witness a major shift in the composition of our economies. A major transition from some sectors that will lose relevance to other sectors that will increase in relevance. The financial sector will play a fundamental role in shifting financial resources and in accompanying this, uh, this process. As a supervisor, of course, for me, what matters are risks. So uh, the prudential aspect I I embodied into this transition. So um, it is important that banks start uh, factoring in uh, into their risk management, also this, uh, this aspect of the transition. And we are now preparing some guidance on how the banks should uh, uh, include in their risk management also the sustainability, uh, the sustainability aspect. Another element which is not directly into, into my remit as, as ECB, uh, uh, but which, for instance, is very much uh, uh, under the attention of the European Banking Authority, which is, in my view, very important, is transparency. Transparency is uh, key 
now that we are developing a taxonomy almost over, if I understand well, of what is green, what is brown, what is uh, in the middle, uh, I think it would be important to push banks, financial institutions to disclose more and uh, uh, to allow market discipline also <coughs> to, play, to play a role. I've seen that uh, some uh, uh, news agencies have published information on some banks being particularly exposed to brown sectors and this immediately triggered a reaction from these banks announcing targets. So I think this could be a very important uh, disciplining element. Another uh, area in which I think we could provide a contribution is stress testing. Uh, uh, in a sense, uh, now banks tend to look at risks in a very short-term perspective. No? They, they, they estimate their risk parameters, probabilities of default, loss given default, in general with one year, maximum three years uh, uh, time horizon. If you talk about transition, you are talking about much longer time frames. And the stress test can maybe try to help banks to push banks and maybe to push supervisors also to lengthen the, the horizon to uh, measure and manage risks. I'm less enthusiastic at the moment about green and brown support in penalizing factors, not because I'm uh, opposed, uh, let's say, by uh, uh, ideology, or, but because I think we don't have enough evidence. Th I mean, I think that uh, prudential requirements should be based on risks, and we don't have enough evidence that uh, a green investment is uh, uh, less risky than, than, than a brown investment. Uh, it could be in a longer term, but uh, in, in the transition it could also be the opposite. So we need to be careful and, uh, and uh, gather sufficient evidence to decide how to move in that area. Okay, I'm going to ask the, the last question, then I will take a question from, uh, from um, the Slido and then a series of questions from the floor. So that's going to be one last question from me, one from Slido and then from the floor. So what career advice, this is on a more personal note, would you give to future bankers or supervisors, in particular given the increasing importance of technological innovation in this field? So what would, would be your personal advice to the students who are here, supposing they want to become supervisors? Well, let me do a little bit of a commercial for the profession, because I think this is... Uh, this is uh, this is a job that uh, will not bring you a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, a lot of, nobody will thank you in general. When things go well, uh, it's very, very uh, seldom that somebody praises you for, for the job you perform. If something goes wrong, you are the first in the line also when you don't have uh, too many responsibilities in the case at hand. So it's not, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, the, if you look at it objectively, the payoffs are not very balanced, are very skewed. Uh, but still, let's say, uh, what I can say is that if I, if I look at my colleagues, also the younger colleagues uh, that are with me now at the ECB, it's a very rewarding uh, uh, job. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very interesting because it allows you to combine this uh, passion that I have and many of my colleagues have for serving the public interest uh, with uh, really being at the cutting edge of what is happening in the industry. So you see really all the innovations, all the new practices, uh, all the new malpractices sometimes, and, uh, and it is a very, very challenging and enriching job. You, you mentioned technologies, and of course technologies are becoming more and more important. We, we do regularly collect from banks and from supervisors uh, their views on what are the top risks facing banks and uh, in the last two years uh, cyber risk for instance has become one of the top uh, uh, listed risks uh, both from the industry side and on the on the supervisory side uh, but also IT risk more generally I mean there is plenty of outsourcing going on in the industry uh, to uh, companies uh, sometimes in remote uh, jurisdictions so I mean I think it's uh, really a challenging uh, framework and I must also say that uh, sometimes uh, uh, one one think uh, talk, talk about uh, talks about IT. You think about fancy new gadgets and the like, but sometimes it's really how to manage the core um, asset that banks have, which is information. And uh, one of the most depressing findings in my new job since I joined 
is how poor banks are in terms of managing their data and in terms of having integrity, capability of aggregate data across uh, jurisdictions, across, across companies in their group. I mean, that's really, a, a, I mean, sometimes it's, it's really a challenge. Uh, but anyway, I hope that uh, some of you in the, in, the, in, the, in the audience will consider this as a, as a good uh, commercial for the profession. But I would say that also for those of you that instead uh, uh, will choose to, 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 you know, to follow a career in the, in the private sector in this area, I think it is important that, that uh, both sides share a strong uh, um, attachment to good culture and to really to the health sustainability of, of, of the business and that, uh, uh, let's say, the, the excesses of the past uh, remain also on the, on the new uh, young professionals as, as a memory. Although you have not experienced this firsthand, I mean, you have plenty of materials that I'm sure you have studied in, <laughs> in Marina's courses or in other courses uh, uh, to, to make you well aware that uh, if you want to, to avoid repeating the errors of the past, uh, we need to build the industry on, on different premises. Thank you very much. So. People here in the room, uh, you can raise your hand so that you will receive a mic and ask a question, but I will start with the first question from, from Slido. So, Mr. Nia, what do you think about Bitcoin? What role do you see it playing in the context of the ECB? And if when Bitcoin gains even more popularity among the, new, the younger generations? So, what's your view on Bitcoins? Uh, the, the EBA, when I was there, was one of the first authorities globally that issued a report on Bitcoin, trying to identify the risks and the, and the, and the benefits of these type of innovations. And uh, I would say that as a supervisor, let's say, I, I see first of all the benefits of the new technologies uh, that are underlying Bitcoins or other virtual currencies, so these distributed ledger technology. It's uh, something which uh, can also uh, have... Uh, very interesting uh, uh, use. Um, let's say, um, the, the I also see the point that uh, uh, international payments sometimes, especially, are very, are very, remain, although in the European Union, in the Euro area, we have br brought the cost back ba down basically to zero of cross-border uh, transactions, but still, if you if you have payments uh, internationally, they remain quite expensive. So I see also the benefits of having a sort of payments uh, 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 instrument that can be deployed globally at very low cost. The risks that I saw in the in the construction of uh, of virtual currencies uh, are, however, uh, I mean the first one is uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, the money laundering controls. So uh, the basic of, uh, of the virtual currencies is anonymity. You know? So there is a check through a, a complex uh, uh, technological ledger, but basically it preserves the anonymity of the transactions. And that is not good for the, uh, the anti-money laundering controls that are, are rule based on the identification of the beneficial owner. The other point is, uh, is uh, um, investor protection. Uh, so uh, when I was at the EBA, we made a warning to consumers that basically if you put your money in these, uh, uh, in these uh, uh, currencies, you might lose it all. I would not even call them currencies, actually. I would call them assets because that's what they are. You can lose all your money, and this happened. I mean, there have been several of these uh, virtual uh, currency exchanges that have been hacked and uh, the, 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 the amounts have been, uh, have been stolen. Uh, finally, the key point to me is uh, uh, how do you define the boundaries when these activities are banking or should be regulated and when they could remain in the unregulated world. That's a very difficult question, uh, but to me, of course, uh, if you start uh, collecting uh, something that could look like deposits, for me that is a red line. Deposits need to be collected by banks, they enter into the money creation mechanism, and they should be done only by uh, uh, regulated, uh, regulated institutions. Okay, so we're going to take some questions from, uh, from the floor. Can, if we have the mic. Okay. Hi. 
Sí, Wong. I'm Ricardo Gampli, a first year student of the master degree in financial risk and data analysis. So my question is, public opinion, especially in, Ita in Italy, is critical about banking issues. To avoid the risk of further lowering in citizen trust in the banking system, I would like to know whether information and educational policies regarding the introduction of neg negative deposit rates are envisaged. Well, there are different elements in your questions. Uh, negative interest rates, uh, um, let's say, first of all, are, are designed by the, by the central bank, by the European Central Bank, uh, to deal with, uh, uh, with the, the issue of uh, uh, very low inflation below target and, uh, uh, let's say, in, uh, of the problems in terms of the uh, slow recovery after the crisis in the, in the euro area, in the euro area economy. Now, of course, this has a negative impact on the uh, margins <coughs> in, the, in, the European, uh, in the European banks, but it has also a positive impact on the banks via the increase in uh, lending volumes and the fact that, of course, borrowers are more likely to pay back their, their loans because uh, uh, the interest rates are, of course, uh, uh, lower. Also, I would say that uh, the, 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 the negative interest rates policy, the very low interest rate environment has favored the process by banks of, uh, um, of uh, uh, disposing of their non-performing loans or cleaning their balance sheets, which is also important for the banks to perform their key function, which is lending to good, uh, let's say, uh, to good business opportunities and to, to households. Now, uh, in terms of information, I think that uh, uh, the, the ECB has done uh, extensive studies, has published a lot, is engaging in, uh, in, in dialogue on these, on these issues, on the impact of negative interest uh, uh, rates, and uh, so I think that there is a lot uh, which, is, uh, which is being done. And, uh, and I think the same should happen also on the supervisory side. Um, on the supervisory side, traditionally supervision is perceived as, uh, as uh, an activity which is bound by confidentiality. You, know, you enter into uh, contact with very price sensitive information on individual banks, so supervisors traditionally do not like to talk a lot about uh, about their banks, so these type of events also are relatively new in the, in the profession, I must say. Uh, I think that now that, uh, that we, we have seen the impact of the crisis, that the uh, sensitivity of the general public to uh, banking policies, to banking supervision has increased, and also now that we have uh, legislation that entails that if there is a crisis, let's say the shareholders first, but also the private creditors should be uh, responsible for taking the losses for the banks, as in any other sector of the economy, well, then you need to give more information, I think. And uh, we need to be more transparent, to publish more information, also on our assessment of the banks, and that's something that I'm putting high in my, in my objectives. Okay, so I'm going to change the, the etiquette a little bit. I would like to have the mic here. I would like the students who want to ask a question to come here with the mic, so it takes less time for us. So if Ricardo, you can take the mic here. The students who want to ask questions, you come down. I'm going to do a question from uh, Slido so that people have time to line up. You come down, start coming down, and so we make this more effective because this is a large room. It's going to take us ages to, to just get the mic to move. So uh, we have a question from Slido, Mr. Enria. What do you think the direct impact of Brexit would be on ECB and European Union economics? What if other members of the Union, like Italy, decide to quit from the Euro? On the impact on Brexit, let's say, um, it's clear that uh, <coughs> the uh, banks that were providing services to uh, Euro area counterparts from London uh, will not benefit of the passport anymore, so will not be able anymore to provide services from London, so are relocating. 
and uh, as a result of this relocation, we will have uh, uh, 25 uh, banks which have asked new license and other banks which have extended the licenses they had, and we will have seven additional banks under our responsibility at the, at the ECB. And uh, um, in general, we, estim we agreed with these banks their target operating model, so at the end of the transition, there will be 1.2 trillion of assets that, of euros, of assets that will be shifted uh, towards uh, our responsibility. That's a big responsibility for us, so it will be a lot of, uh, of work. That's not something that makes me happy. Brexit is a very sad event. It breaks the, 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 the union, and, uh, and it's uh, definitely not a positive uh, development. And that's something that would uh, lead me to strongly discourage uh, to entertain this, uh, this thought with reference to, to, to Italy, because for Italy it would be Brexit to the cube, because of course there is also the, the Euro dimension, which would make uh, things more difficult, also because uh, in the treaty uh, the, the Euro is uh, irreversible, so it would make <coughs> things uh, more difficult. You would need to leave the Union, so very difficult. Okay, <coughs> thank you very much. So Good evening. Yep. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Herria. My name is Francesco Conti, second year student of the master's degree in international finance and risk management. My question is, banking regulation is becoming more stricter year after year. Which are the future trends on shadow banking regulation? Thank you. Thanks a lot, a very good question, I must say. Uh, the, the term shadow banking has entered the bit into uh, misuse now is not uh, is not uh, uh, very fashionable anymore but i think that the point of uh, let's say non regulated uh, institutions performing quasi bank activities it remains uh, very very relevant actually you have seen a lot of growth in the uh, in the activities in the financing activities of these type of entities now, does this mean that we need to regulate all of them? I don't think that, that if something is in gets important, you need necessarily to regulate it, but you need to make sure that if you have uh, uh, really quasi-banking activities, uh, then you need to attract those under the responsibility of, uh, of regulation. I mean, uh, I don't think you should, uh, if something, let's say, is banking de facto needs to be regulated as a bank. And if it is not a bank, but it is uh, increasing the risk to banks, because banks are exposed to this sector, we should monitor this more carefully. And unfortunately, today, we don't have enough information on that. Good evening, Mr. Ria. Uh, I'm Daniele Baraldi, second year student in international finance and risk management. Thank you very much for this opportunity, first of all. My question is, what are, in your opinion, the most important action that Europe should take in order to reach a strong economic union? Well, for me, of course, I'm biased, so maybe I will not take the most, but it's the, the key point is that uh, the introduction of the euro has been a historical moment. And I think that we need uh, to make all the possible efforts to complete the construction complete the construction of the euro, of the banking union, especially of the banking union, the priority for me is uh, to have a fully fledged uh, uh, deposit guarantee scheme and to have uh, uh, really greater harmonization and, uh, and the smooth uh, uh, mechanism for, let's say, managing also banking <coughs> crisis. We have seen how delicate this issue is for all the citizens in Europe. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good evening, uh, Mr. Ria. My name is uh, Darius Karimi, and I'm actually enrolled in uh, international finance, master's degree. And uh, my question is, uh, how can banks improve profitability um, in a low interest environment without uh, cut costs through layoffs and uh, um, closer branches? The example is uh, Unicredit. And uh, how can how, how banks can we do that, can do that? Well, uh, let's say, as I mentioned also before, uh, the, the, the cost efficiency is a key ingredient for banks to recover their, their, um, their position in the, in the market and to increase their valuations in the markets and to uh, achieve a business model which is sustainable in the medium and long term. Uh, 
and we will have now in low interest rates probably for a longer period of time. Um, so I think that, uh, let's say, being able to uh, contain costs and uh, invest in new technologies is an essential uh, element in this, in this strategy. I think also that consolidation could be a good uh, tool to, you know, uh, achieve cost efficiencies, invest into new technologies, and uh, have the scale that allows banks to uh, get the revenues that compensate for this. So I think that one should act both on the, on the revenue side, possibly through consolidation and through the cost sides. And, uh, but that's unavoidable. I mean, the, the world is changing and uh, banks need to make efforts to get up to speed with the new, with the new market conditions. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Enria. I'm Matteo Sabella, second year student of the master's degree in economics and communication for management and innovation. I wanted to ask how the fight on duties between USA and China can affect the European banking system. Thank you. Uh, well, it's clear that, uh, that uh, the environment of uh, trade wars, uh, tariffs, and uh, barriers between, between states uh, can affect, uh, uh, I mean, actually is a driver of the slowdown also in the European economy. And when the, 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 the European economy slows down, of course, uh, banks uh, are, are going to, uh, to suffer because of that. We identified uh, political trade tensions as one of the top risks for, European, for Euro area banks under our responsibility uh, for the next year, and this will be something that uh, we will probably uh, look at in the in the stress test for next year. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Enria. Uh, my name is Timur Adif. I am a second year uh, double degree master uh, student at the program of uh, corporate finance from North Caucasus Federal University in Russia. Uh, I want to ask you about further extension of the Eurozone. According to the Maastricht uh, Treaty of 1992, all European U Union members are obliged to adopt the euro and, uh, uh, as, as their sole currency. But at the present moment, there are, there are nine European Union um, uh, members which have not adopted the euro and continue to use their sole currency. So the question is, uh, can we expect joining the eurozone uh, one or more European Union members in the next five, ten years? Thank you. The short answer is yes. Uh, actually, we already have uh, the process uh, started for two member states, uh, Bulgaria and Croatia. Bulgaria has asked for uh, joining, per participating in the banking union, which will be a prerequisite to start uh, ERM2 at the same time and then start the process for joining the, the single currency. So we have already completed the comprehensive assessment for Bulgarian banks and the process is well advanced and we started the process for Croatian banks. So I think th this is a good signal that uh, there is not only uh, countries that want to leave uh, the European family, but also countries that want, want to have stronger links with us. Good evening. My name is uh, Li Ping Kong. I come from the second year uh, of my uh, master degree from international uh, finance and risk management. So my question is, uh, for uh, cryptocurrency, do you think directly um, prohib prohibit the uh, financial institution to, uh, from holding and selling is a way too simple and uh, rigid? Thank you. Well, we actually, uh, as EBA, encouraged regulated institutions not to engage with the uh, buying and selling of, uh, of cryptocurrencies for the simple reason that eventually, uh, let's say, you, you would uh, lend uh, some entry into the uh, pool of deposits, no, indirectly for, for these type of, so we wanted to keep the two sectors really separated. But uh, I realize that uh, this will be difficult. Uh, we know that already several banks have started engaging and lending to uh, currencies platforms. Some uh, cryptocurrency platforms have actually got a, a, an authorization pay as payments institutions in some countries. So it's very difficult to actually uh, go to a strict separation. Uh, 
So I think that the Basel Committee has recently issued some criteria, some proposals on how to, uh, let's say, treat the risk of banks when they engage into uh, lending uh, towards uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. So that's probably the avenue now. Good evening, my name is uh, Francesca Manna and me too, I'm uh, at the second year of the master's degree in international uh, finance and risk management. Uh, you previously talked about <coughs> the um, liquidation process of US, uh, so can you add the other pros and cons uh, of uh, the European supervisory process in respect of other countries such as US? Well, I mean, I don't think it's very polite, you know, to <laughs> say, say w in which areas we are better than the U.S. or the right. And uh, honestly, I, I don't think that's, uh, I mean, we are, uh, th the nice thing for the, for, the, for the ECB supervision is that we are the new kid in the blocks, right? So uh, what happens when you, when you join uh, the, the, the benefits of being a latecomer is that you can build on the best practices out there. So, um, and we have built on the best practices within the European Union, within the euro area, but also we have built on the best practices from the, from the US uh, from, uh, and from other, from other uh, countries across the world. So I think that at the moment we have tried to distill uh, the, 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 the strength. The strength of our model, I think, is, uh, is especially um, the focus on on-site examinations. I mean, that's, uh, that's something which I think is, uh, is, is very strong. And having built teams that, uh, um, that come from different national authorities, plus people, staff from the ECB, I think it's a great advantage because you, you bring very different uh, traditions, approaches, perspective, and then uh, you are, you are much more, you know, you're much stronger in the way in which you can uh, uh, review the bank's uh, the bank's books. So I think the on-site is, in my view, one of the of the strongest element. The other aspect on which I think we are probably at the edge of the uh, of the supervisory profession is in the work we have been doing on internal models. No one else in the world has done so many reviews of internal models as the ECB. As I mentioned, 200 on-site inspections, and each of them going through also different models. So in that area, we have gained a lot of expertise. I would say. Thank you. If it's possible, I have another <coughs> question. Uh, I would like to ask you, what do you believe about, if you believe in um, the accommodative European monetary policy and if it, uh, this kind of policy is really working in increasing the, the bank's uh, profitability? Well, as you know, in the, in the ECB, by legislation, you have a strict separation principle between uh, supervision and monetary policy. It would be very inappropriate of me, but of course, let's say, being under uh, the same uh, roof, I, I, I strongly support uh, the analysis, also because we have indeed a dialogue. I strongly support the stance that uh, I think that the, the ECB has put forward very strong arguments for the accommodative stance that has prevailed so far. Of course, on the banking sector, there are side effects and I think the decisions taken in September that has recognized uh, the need to alleviate uh, the burden in terms of uh, the uh, remuneration of the reserves at the central bank, so the so-called tiering of reserves, I mean that has recognized uh, uh, that uh, there are side effects that then need to be managed but I think that that's the, the, right, uh, the right policy. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Alberto Maria Radici from the uh, curriculum in macroeconomic policy and financial market the first year. And I want to ask you about the reform about the European uh, DSM. And the, the main discussion politically is about the presence in the board of directors of just economists, of just technical figures and not politicians. So uh, about the reform, but more in generally, what do you think, do you think that this kind of crisis, public debt crisis, should be managed more by politicians or by technicians? The board of the ESM is composed of the finance ministers of the, uh, of the euro area. So it's actually the politicians that eventually take the final decisions in the, in the, in the ESM. So there needs to be, uh, of course, always at the European level, a decision that is taken 
at the political level, but it needs to be based on strong technical analysis. So it's important also, of course, to have uh, good uh, uh, technical experts in the, in the, in the, in the, in the analysis, whatever the, the level. I'm talking about any, let's say, European institutions now. Good evening, I'm Matteo Gallone, second year student of the master's degree in international finance and risk management. And um, during these uh, last months, uh, some banks have started applying uh, negative interest rates on uh, deposits, on current accounts. So my question is, uh, within this scenario, who is the bad guy? The ECB with its uh, monetary policy or the banking sector that is stuck in a sort of uh, QE infinity scenario? And uh, if all banks uh, apply negative interest rates on deposits, wouldn't the enterprise sector be too weak and exposed to excessive uh, market or portfolio risks? Thank you. Are there really bad guys here? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Um, of course, negative interest rates uh, on, on deposits is, uh, is a very, uh, let's say, extreme policy. Uh, you're not accustomed to pay to keep your, 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 your savings uh, in, in, in the bank. But of course, it's uh, is an extreme policy to try to uh, support uh, increased, uh, increased spending. And, uh, and again, I mean, eventually, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, the choice of the, uh, of the savers to decide where they want to allocate their, their savings. And if deposits will become, of course, not convenient, they will have choices to invest in other in other types of assets. But anyway, I understand that uh, the application of negative interest rates to deposits is a very delicate, uh, very delicate issue, and not all banks uh, want to go into that territory, especially no bank wants to go into that territory for uh, insured deposits. So that's definitely something that all the banks consider off limits. Um, in general, let's say, uh, it's not we as, uh, as uh, supervisors have no uh, say on the pricing policies of the banks and we shouldn't have any say on the pricing policies of the banks. But indeed, let's say eventually, the, the, uh, I think that in these areas, uh, competition is what should uh, rule the game. So if, uh, if uh, somebody wants to apply negative interest rates and somebody doesn't, uh, the depositors will have, uh, let's say, a choice. And for instance, we see now much more at the European level a role for these uh, platforms, these uh, uh, like raising deposit solutions uh, that are actually channeling deposits from certain countries which, have, which are applying uh, negative interest rates or zero uh, interest rates to countries within the banking union that are applying positive interest rates. So there are also new technologies that are supporting customers that want to move their Deposits. The point is whether this uh, mobility of deposits eventually could be could have some shortcomings also in terms of uh, the stability of the sector as a whole. For the moment being, it is marginal adjustments, and the negative interest policies are applied only to corporates and to very high holdings. So for the moment being, I think the the, the process is manageable. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Heria. Uh, I am Federica Vato, second uh, year student uh, of the master's degree in financial intermediaries, international finance and risk management. My question is, uh, what do you think uh, in, in terms of uh, European supervision about uh, the development of the market for financial conglomerates and the possibility for the ECB, ECB to make uh, concessions for uh, m a between banks. Thank you. Well, on financial conglomerates, let's say we are responsible for financial conglomerates. There are many uh, across Europe. And uh, um, during the crisis, financial conglomerates have not uh, performed very well, to be honest. And the market is sometimes uh, uh, skeptical about uh, the effectiveness. But there have been interesting synergies and some of these conglomerates, to be honest, have been rather profitable uh, lately. So we need to actually um, uh, look uh, uh, carefully into financial conglomerates and the types of risks that they, that they raise, no? especially the distribution, the use of the bank distribution channel for uh, insurance products and, uh, and, 
and uh, the cross subsidization that can happen between the different uh, business lines and also the, um, the, the possible infra conglomerates, infra group, uh, uh, let's say exposures that can be, uh, that can be and how you measure the, the, the capital of the conglomerates as a whole. So there are a number of areas which uh, uh, require some, uh, some attention uh, from, uh, uh, from our side. So that's uh, definitely an, an important aspect. The second point you mentioned was uh, m, &A. m &A. On m and again, uh, uh, if I look at the banking sector where it is right now, there is still a lot of excess capacity. The, the excess, if you look at any crisis in any sector, the automobile sector, the, the steel sector, after the crisis, you had a mop-up of excess capacity via consolidation. And this has not happened that much in the European banking sector. You have had it in the US banking sector, but not as much in the European banking sector. And uh, if you need to invest in new technologies, and uh, I, I think that some consolidation will probably need to happen. Of course, we as supervisors, when we look at a, a, at a merger project, we look at the viability of the business plan and whether the bank will be able to respect all the minimum requirements throughout the process. There was until recently a perception that uh, we as supervisors are actually uh, preventing mergers from happening. So I'm trying to dispel this, uh, this assumption that we are against merger, we are not. But of course, uh, in order to be approved, they need to be sound and, uh, and, and, and have a, a strong business project. Thank you. I'm going to take a question from Slido, which is, is I'm going to read. So, Mr. Neria, which are the past, present, and perhaps future most challenging issues in banking that you experienced? So, past and present, you have experienced, and things you envisage for the future. Well, in the past, I would say without any doubt, uh, I remember I started at the EBA in 2011. We started the stress test uh, beginning of March. 10th of April, Greece started uh, uh, the sovereign debt crisis and it had uh, private sector involvement in July, when uh, one week after we published the results of the stress test. That was a, a period that uh, I would uh, uh, not, uh, uh, let's say, leave again if I, if I, if I can. Um, present, I would say that the issues we were mentioning uh, before are the most important ones. Uh, so the, the really the, the the challenge now for me is uh, really the low profitability in the banking sector uh, and uh, uh, the need for restructuring. How to drive the sector towards more restructuring to become the, again uh, uh, positive in the view of investors, able to attract investments, capital, and uh, uh, and uh, become viable in the in the in the longer term. And uh, future. Uh, well, future challenge, I think, th at the moment, I think still digitalization ranks high. Of course, sustainability is also another important challenge. So the two challenges are, are both very high, but I would say that at the moment, uh, uh, the one which is uh, going to uh, challenge both banks and supervisors most in the next uh, two, three years, I would say, is digitalization. Good evening. My name is Andrea Franco. I'm a second year student of uh, international finance and risk management uh, master's degrees. Uh, my question is, um, what is, uh, in your opinion, uh, the solution for the banking uh, market segmentation in Italy? Thank you. Well, we have, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, the, the, the Italian, Austrian, and German banking sector have been traditionally the ones which have had the, the, the widest uh, range of uh, very small institutions, often uh, uh, cooperatives, sometimes savings banks. That's not in itself a, a, a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's an element of strength of the, of, the, of the European banking sector having an ecosystem that uh, has a number of different uh, players. But of course, in times of uh, difficulties, uh, and low profitability, um, there could be challenges uh, specifically on these business models. And I think that the steps which have been taken in Italy and in other member states to integrate more this sector through initiatives that have created a sort of uh, uh, 
sector-wide merger or light merger, or like, uh, I mean, in, in, in France, the, the Credit Agricole Group or Rabobank in the, in, in the Netherlands, Raffaisen in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Austria, uh, the, Co the Volksbanken Group in, uh, in, uh, in, in Germany, and now also the, the two new groups of uh, uh, Banque di Credito Cooperativo, so uh, ICREA, Casa Centrale Bank. I mean, these are interesting examples of how to benefit, in benefit from integration and uh, consolidation, while at the same time maintaining also some aspects of uh, local you know, expertise and local knowledge. So I think that that process is, uh, is, very, is very interesting and, uh, and that's the way in which you can also move towards uh, uh, less fragmentation. Fragmentation is also unfortunately now an element uh, that is associated with the flag. No? So you have a lot of segmentation of markets uh, between countries and that's something which in my view is also, I mean for me is one of the big, biggest priorities. I mean how to foster really the development of the banking union into a truly unified domestic market for banks and that's, uh, that's still, uh, still a challenge. I mean, I may speak for, talk for hours on that but I would leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Ania. My name is Xingru, and I'm an exchange student from China. It's my third year in venturing finance. And uh, my question is, uh, now, nowadays in China, we talk about the euro economy, and we mention debt crisis. So how do you think that um, why the, the euro economy is easily attacked by debt crisis, and how will the single supervisory mechanism raised by ECB will alleviate the problem? That's the question. Well, what you have seen in the, during the crisis was uh, um, that uh, shocks that hit yes. a specific member state in the, in the euro area started uh, a, a loop between the banks and their sovereigns. So in some cases, like uh, Greece and Portugal, it was the sovereign that was actually affected by the shock and the banking sector was contaminated via the exposures to the sovereigns. In uh, Spain and Ireland, it was the opposite. It was the banking sector that deteriorated and the banking crisis triggered uh, a, a, a difficulties for the, for the member state, for the sovereign, for the fiscal position of the sovereign as a whole. And this generated a, a, a major, let's say, major concerns about uh, the uh, overall stability of the, of, of, the, of the single currency and integrity of the single currency. But since then, major steps have been made to repair these problems. I mean, the, the European stability mechanism, which has been mentioned as one of the, of the key issues uh, today, is one of the tools which have allowed supporting certain member states and uh, avoiding, uh, let's say, uh, outright default. Uh, the banking union and the centralization of supervision and uh, resolution uh, at the European level for the largest banks in particular is another important step. The deposit guarantee scheme is still the third leg of the, of the, of the union which is, uh, which is missing and as I said we should make some progress in that respect. But now the, 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 Euro, uh, the, the architecture for the euro is much stronger than it was and uh, uh, although I would say that we should not be uh, too comfortable with the current uh, state of the art and we need to continue strengthening and completing the banking union if we want really to avoid uh, this type of crisis in the future. Thank you very much. Good evening, I'm Matteo Benigni for CEO of Financial Risk and Meso Analysis. As my, <coughs> my question is, as soon as the mandate at ACB expires, having the opportunity to choose between renewing your position or return to the Bank of Italy. What would you choose? Well, first of all, I'm one of the, uh, of the uh, few that have already returned to the Bank of Italy because I was uh, uh, first at the ECB in the early 2000s, then I was in London at the Committee of European Banking Supervisors, and then I came back to the Bank of Italy in 2008 uh, uh, just a few days before Lehman, I must say. So, um, so, uh, so I, I, I'm very attached uh, still to the to the bank of to the Bank of Italy. I learned my my, my profession there, and uh, I'm very attached to the to this. Uh, 
I must say that uh, uh, when I finish my mandate here, I think I could enjoy some time of rest, if you allow me. So, <laughs> so that, but then, uh, then, uh, then, I mean, I, w I will be open to you know other other jobs at the national and European level. I'm more, uh, most attached to the European project, of course, but I'm most attached to Italy as well. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Aria. I'm Emanuele Bersani, first year student from uh, the master degree uh, in data analysis. So um, my questions are, what are the tips you would like to give to students who pursue a prestigious career like yours? And in addition, how did you imagine it would be to uh, work within the European Central Bank's supervisory board? And how would you rate your work from um, January 1st, 2019 uh, to today? Thank you. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, I, I think that uh, um, you need really to to follow your. I mean, to, to f I mean, in, in my view, i integrity is an important part of this job. You need really to sometimes also take responsibility, take risk when you see something that is uh, not going in the right direction you need sometimes to uh, take also risk uh, in an organization to really go up in your career. You need to be really yourself. Uh, you, sometimes when you, when you start as a, as, a, as a young person in, in, in a career, you tend to conform. No? You tend to see what the others around you do and you tend to try to you know, move uh, with the wave. I would strongly invite you to uh, make up your own minds on things and speak up, always. And this usually in the long term pays. I mean, you can have also some moments in which this doesn't pay, but in the long term, I can tell you this uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this pays. And if it doesn't pay, maybe the job is not worth for you. Um, in terms of uh, um, the, the job uh, and uh, the job at the ECB, I mean, it is, uh, it is most rewarding. First of all, because I must say that it is a, an extraordinary uh, work environment, uh, very young, ECB supervision is very young, much younger than the rest of the ECB, much more diverse, also in terms of gender and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, origins, and, uh, and uh, you have a lot, I mean, th there is this vibe still of the startup. The startups, I like startups, I've done the ECB, Mark I in 99, I've done SEBS, I've done the EBA, and I've done uh, the ECB supervision a few years later, but still a startup. Uh, startups are very nice because you really write on a, on a white sheet of paper. No, you don't have the burden of tradition, of the past, of doing things uh, as they were always done, so you can really uh, write things from new, and that's really exciting. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, uh, the, the people is very passionate about uh, the job. Of course, I don't want to sell this as the best. W I mean, it is a bit heavy, I can tell you, uh, for me, for sure. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very heavy job. And if you feel the responsibility for what you do, you don't sleep always uh, very, nice, very, very, very well at night. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a very rewarding job. Good evening, Mr. Ria. My name is Andrea Riverso, and I work in the fund sector of a data provider. Uh, in my job, I, uh, I analyze uh, key investor information documents, and sometimes there are funds uh, which have uh, the score ESG, even if the issuer is not an ESG company. So my question is, uh, can, as uh, a president of the um, Vigilance Council for B AC ACB, can we consider a fund's ESG even if uh, the issuer is not an ESG company? Or it is necessary uh, that uh, the fund and the issuer are both ESG? Thank you. As you know, I'm not in the fund industry, so I would not go into the, the details of this. But let's say that we need to, to develop jointly clear criteria. I mean, because it's clear that now the sustainability is becoming such a big issue. Uh, there will be a tendency to uh, wrap everything as ESG, sustainable, and the like. We need to be 
to have clear criteria on what qualifies and what doesn't qualify. I think the first important step was to develop a common taxonomy, and that's what I, th I understand the Council and Parliament should have agreed in the recent days, so I hope that this uh, step is almost <coughs> completed. Once this step is, is done, we should have the supervisors in all the sectors, in banking, in, in insurance, in the, in the asset management industry, to develop clear criteria, to have more disclosure, and to avoid, uh, let's say, greenwashing type of, uh, uh, of practices uh, prevailing in the market. Thank you. I'll take a couple of questions from Slido. Um, so, what is your biggest motivator in your day-to-day -day job? So, you talked about integrity, but then what wakes you up? When you, so, you, you, when you're not awake at night, which we heard is one part of the job, uh, when you get up, so what is your motivator? What drives you? Well, uh, I must say that... Uh, Europe for me is a big driver. I mean, working for Europe uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is an element of uh, extraordinary uh, drive. I, I, I remember when I started uh, uh, attending uh, the meetings under the European Monetary Institute, the precursor to of, the, of the ECB, and meeting and working together with colleagues from other central banks uh, uh, and uh, developing a, a new institutional construction which was able to bring together uh, Europe in a, in a new way. I mean, I think I found this always uh, fascinating, enriching, and, uh, and very, very motivating. So that's what still drives me, let's say, almost 40 years after. Okay, I think technology failed me because I think I missed a question which had more likes, and so I must get it right. So what do you think about the Deutsche Bank situation? which had 17 likes, whether, whereas your day-to-day -day motivator only 16. So I'll <laughs> check on the maths. Uh, of course, it's very difficult for me to, as a supervisor, to speak in public about it, an individual bank, uh, and I, I usually decline these type of questions, but what I would say simply is that uh, uh, Deutsche Bank uh, uh, is one of those banks that had clearly an issue with the the viability of the business model and the perception of the market on the long-term viability of the business model. The low market valuations reflected that judgment and the bank uh, uh, is now engaged in a, an important uh, change in, 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 their, in, their, in, their, in their business model and we have been uh, uh, pushing and, uh, and accompanying this change. Well, since I'm very conscious of the time, thank you very much again, Mr. Enria. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, well, we, we don't have time. So, uh, thanks everyone f for such an interesting conversation, for the questions and discussion. I hope you all enjoyed it and leave the event with food for thought and possibly may I encourage you to become supervisors or bankers, good supervisors or good bankers, because I think banks play a fundamental role in the economy. They are part of the plumbing for the economy, so we need good bankers. But before you go, I would like to ask you to access Slido one last time to answer a very short feedback survey and let us know your opinion on today's ECB Youth Dialogue. Before though, a big round of applause for Mr. Enria. Thank you very, very much.